Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Oh, good. That's a good beginning. I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to come here and talk to you guys today. A um, few of you have heard various incarnations of this talk over the course of the summer at a few meetings, but hopefully I'll be able to show you a couple of new things. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the topic that is most near and dear to my heart, which is supermassive black hole spin measurements and actively accreting galactic nuclei. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about what X-ray spectroscopy of supermassive black holes can tell us about these systems, making, of course, a point of focus on measuring the black hole spins themselves. I'll talk about where we are now with the current distribution of spin measurements and where we're going in the future with both near-term and far-term instruments that are going to be coming online. And I'll talk a little bit about what our goals for the science are in terms of how we'd like to take it to the next level, so to speak. So in terms of what we learn by doing X-ray spectroscopy of supermassive black hole systems, especially ones that are actively accreting, we learn about, of course, elemental abundances, dust content, and that's from you know, several different zones in the system, the disk, the torus, any intrinsic absorbing gas in the narrow line or the broad line region. We learn about gas kinematics, inflows, outflows, turbulence, torus covering fraction, whether these things are patchy or more completely whole, disk orientation to our line of sight, and of course, if you're talking about being able to look at the very closest regions surrounding the event horizon, we can talk about coronal characteristics and the spin of the black hole, um, as well as its mass. So black hole spin, again, is what I'm going to be focusing on mostly today. The reason this is important, uh, spin tells us a lot about the relative roles of accretion versus gas, uh, rather, gas accretion versus mergers over the course of cosmic time in these systems. It's also thought to drive jet production and outflows and to seed the interstellar and intergalactic medium with matter and energy. And of course, also, the spin is intimately tied to the innermost part of the accretion flow. In fact, the effects of black hole spin only manifest very close to the event horizon. So we have to be able to use X-ray spectroscopy to get at this question in the first place. No other wavelength will do at the moment. The way we do this in practice for the supermassive black hole systems is by utilizing the reflection spectrum that they create. So creation disks around supermassive black holes naturally radiate in the ultraviolet. These ultraviolet photons then become inverse Compton scattered off of the so-called corona electrons that surround the black hole in an as yet unknown geometry. Some portion of those scattered photons go away, coming to our line of sight to become the characteristic power law spectrum that we see here in most AGN. But another portion of those photons, now in the X-rays, get reflected back down onto the disk, exciting a series of fluorescent emission lines, the most prominent of which is iron, largely owing to its high energy, its abundance in these systems, relatively speaking, and its high fluorescence yield. <coughs> so what we do in practice when we have our data from satellites such as XMM, Chandra, Suzaku, and hopefully Astro-H very soon, is we take our lovely X-ray spectrum and we try to fit it with a series of models. There have been a number of models created over the past decade that have addressed the question of what one of these reflection spectra from an accretion disk should look like. Here in the black, I show the most recent and I think the most complete of these models, the silver model done by Javier Garcia, who's in the room right now. Um, he's followed on the work of Randy Ross and Andy Fabian in creating a number of other models of this ilk. But what happens when you take a static slab that's being illuminated by the X-rays themselves is what is shown in the black. What's shown in the red is what happens when you take that system and you embed the potential of a supermassive black hole at the center. Obviously, you see that this dramatically alters, broadens, and skews the line profiles at play here, especially, and most prominently, 
this broad iron line. Now the region that we tend to focus on when we attempt to make black hole spin measurements is the so-called reflection region, sort of the sweet spot from about 3 up to about 40 or so keV, where you would see both the broadened and skewed iron line feature, the iron K line here, as well as the Compton scattering, the Compton hump, as we call it. It's shaped here on the low energy side by the iron K edge of absorption, and then on the high energy side by Compton downscattering. So it creates this characteristic hump that tends to peak around 20 to 30 keV in these systems. So the reason that we're able to extract black hole spin information from spectra like this is that for the broad iron line in particular, the red wing of that feature is incredibly sensitive to the position of the innermost stable circular orbit of the disk. And it turns out that there is a monotonic, very nice relationship between the innermost stable circular orbit of the disk, or the radius of marginal stability, as it's sometimes known, and the black hole spin. The black hole spin here is expe expressed in dimensionless units, from negative 1, meaning a retrograde black hole spin relative to the direction that the disk is rotating, and positive 1, meaning a maximal prograde spin relative to the direction of the disk. So in this case, I've shown you three example line profiles here. The black one is the maximal retrograde case, the red one is the non-spinning case, and the blue one is the maximal prograde spin. You can see that to first order at least, the width of the iron line profile can tell you quite a lot about the black hole spin. Of course, as you're bringing in the disk to lower and lower radii, what you're talking about is having the effects of frame dragging support orbits that are lower down in the gravitational potential well of the black hole, subject to further gravitational redshift. So the majority of the energy and the flux in that line gets shifted down to lower energies, creating the broadening and the skewing that we see. So of course, because we're talking about these Compton reflection features, not only the broad iron line but the Compton hump, we want to be able to look at these features all at once, if at all possible, and to try and make a black hole spin measurement based on what we see. Now a complicating factor in all of this is the presence of absorbing gas intrinsic to these AGN systems. We very, very rarely have a clear view down to the innermost part of the accretion flow. There's almost always absorbing <laughs> gas in some region along our line of sight. So the key to doing this science then becomes deconvolving the spectral signatures of the continuum from the absorption from this reflection that we're trying to ultimately get at here. So I'm illustrating one of the complications of the absorption here. You see the gravitational distortion creating this chunk out of the broad iron line profile and this nice broad wing and this hump, high energy excess. But if you layer enough obscuring gas, especially patchy, partially covering obscuring gas along the line of sight, you can effectively mimic this broad iron line feature here just due to gas obscuration. You'll notice that the high energy hump is a bit different in each case and keep that in mind. But this illustrates the problem that we have in terms of modeling degeneracies. Very often people will say, well, there is no relativistic reflection here, so how can you tell us about black hole spin? You can mimic the exact same thing using five different layers of partially covering patchy gas. This is true, so we have to try and figure out a way to tell what is really happening. This illustrates the importance of bringing broadband X-ray spectroscopy to bear on this science. So as wonderful as Chandra and XMM Newton have been for the study of black hole spins over the past decade, they're limited by their band pass. They both focus on the part of the spectrum less than 10 keV. What I'm showing here is an example of an AGN, in this case NGC 1365, which is a subject of a Nature paper, several, uh, actually only two years ago, by Guido Rizzoliti and collaborators. And what this shows here is the XMM Newton data in green, the green hashes here, and the two models, relativistic reflection, including complex absorption in black, and complex absorption only, with no relativistic reflection in red. As you can see, below 10 keV, these two models overlap almost completely. The models, statistically speaking, are degenerate. You can't tell them apart. However, a simultaneous new star uh, exposure was also taken with the XMM data for this source, and that's plotted here in blue. If you just extend the models out without refitting at all, you can see quite clearly that the relativistic reflection much better mimics the high energy excess seen in the new star data. The complex absorption does not. And this bears up, of course, when you do the refitting and you do the full spectral analysis. So this was very, very nice proof positive that what we think we're seeing here, these relativistic inner disk reflection signatures, are in fact what we're seeing. This is not an artifact of mismodeled absorption in the system. Encouragingly, this particular source varies, order of, uh, varies over two orders of magnitude 
in very short time scales. So this is a campaign of simultaneous XMM and new star observations. It's get taken over the course of less than a year. And as you can see, the column ranges from 10 to the 24 up to about 10 to the 22. Dramatic variations in absorbing column along the line of sight are the only thing that can produce these particular spectral changes in the source. So we know we have an absorber, we know it's thick a lot of the time, and we know that it varies. All of these are complications that we fully acknowledge are in the system. However, when you take that into account and you model the absorber, you notice, oops, excuse me, you notice that you see the exact same residual signatures when you take away that absorbing gas, no matter what its column is, each time. That tells us that the underlying process here, the reflection signatures that we expect, expect in an actively accreting system with an accretion flow that extends down to near or at the innermost stable circular orbit of the disk, is showing this characteristic feature each time, no matter what the absorbing column is doing. So this is encouraging. And in fact, if we perform the full-out spectral fitting, we show that we get the exact same spin constraints in each case, regardless of the change in column density, which is, again, over two orders of magnitude in the source. So this is a revolutionary result for this type of science. I think this has convinced a lot of people that what we're talking about is the real deal in terms of being able to measure black hole spin. And incidentally, the spin that we measure for this source is, as you can see, quite high and prograde. So interestingly, if you treat the two features, the broad iron line and the Compton reflection hump, as independent things not related to each other, and you fit them with phenomenological models, you see that they have a very nice linear relationship, albeit with some scatter. But again, over two orders of magnitude change in column density, it seems like the broad iron line and the Compton hump know about each other, which is what you would expect if they arise from the same physical process of reflection in these sources. Now, the reason why we care about doing these spin measurements is that ultimately we'd like to build up a census to compare with theoretical predictions of the scenario of mergers versus mergers plus some type of gas accretion. A colleague of mine, Marta Voluntary, and her students have been working on this problem for the past decade or so, and they've shown some interesting results from numerical simulations. If you grow the black holes by mergers alone, you get kind of a nice spread in the resulting spin. If you grow them by mergers and you add chaotic gas accretion, that is gas kind of falling into the system with a variety of different angular momenta, you see that ultimately what happens is you spin down the black holes. You wind up with a population of net low spinning black holes in this case. However, if you grow the, the uh, black holes by gas accretion in the prolonged prograde sense, like spinning up a basketball on your finger, you spin it faster and faster, and not surprisingly, you wind up with a population of very high spinning black holes at the end. So if we can amass a statistical sample of AGN with measured black hole spins to compare to this, we can start to get an idea of the relative roles of the mergers and the accretion over recent cosmic epochs. Here's how we're doing so far. We have a sample of 25 measured spins in AGN at this point. These are all using the same relativistic reflection technique. And as you can see, they are highly skewed towards large prograde values. Interestingly, uh, Dom Walton, another colleague of mine, has stacked 27 lensed quasars from Chandra and has found that they seem to have an average spin of about 0.7. Again, that's not an individual source. That's 27 stacked sources, so there's some systematic errors involved in that. But interestingly, it does seem that the average quasar out there that's actively accreting does have a substantial black hole spin. Is there a selection bias at play here? Quite possibly. The science is very, very signal-to-noise intensive. So what we're talking about here is basically cherry-picking the brightest objects to do this type of work with. It's an unfortunate reality of the system, but we typically need hundreds of thousands of photons in order to be able to do these types of measurements and break the modeling degeneracies that I've spoken to you about. So that's one thing to keep in mind. However, bearing that in mind, we can still start to plot the black hole spin versus interesting other variables, like, for example, the black hole mass of the system. It's possible that there is a hint of a decrease with increasing mass. Now, of course, this is an outlying point, but maybe we're starting to see the beginnings of a trend here, something that's interesting to think about. Are we seeing any kind of trend with the Eddington ratio? It doesn't appear so. This is, this is fairly flat. Again, there's a large scatter involved here, but it seems to be approximately constant so far. Now, caveat, caveat, small sample size statistics, blah, blah, blah. But that being said, this is still interesting to think about. And if we can increase our sample size, ideally by an order of magnitude or so, these trends, if they're real, should start to pop a lot more. So that's a look toward the future. And on a personal note, I have to say this is very gratifying because 
I guess it was uh, nine years ago that I was working on my dissertation and we were able to use one of these relativistic line codes to make the first measurement of a black hole using this technique, the black hole spin in MCG6. And the fact that we've come this far and have 25 measured spins right now is pretty amazing. It might not seem like a huge leap, but it used to take days for a computer to sort of chug through those calculations and do this. Now you can do it in minutes. So this is really interesting burgeoning science. Of course, the question remains, where do we go from here? Of course, we have goals. Uh, first and foremost, we'd like to mitigate the systematic uncertainties involved with these types of measurements. We have to make certain assumptions. We assume that the innermost stable circular orbit is, in fact, um, the innermost extent of the disk. We're assuming that there's not emission coming from within that, and we're also assuming that we're not truncated substantially outside that radius. We have to assume at the moment that the disk has a constant density and ionization structure. That's almost certainly not the case, but right now that's an assumption that we make in the modeling. And of course, we have to be able to break the degeneracies between the continuum, the reflection, and the absorption in order to isolate the reflection signatures and to measure the spin. So these are all complicating factors, and that's assuming, again, that you have a radio quiet source. If you want to take these measurements in radio loud sources to check for any correlation with jet production, which is, of course, very interesting science, the complicating factor there is any contamination that you might get from the jet itself in your X-ray spectrum. That can serve to harden the spectrum a little bit and can skew your spin measurements accordingly. So there are all kinds of things to take um, in mind there as you're making these, uh, these measurements. And of course, ideally, what we would like to do is to be able to probe out farther in redshift. But because this is such signal-to-noise dependent science, it requires a lot of photons to do that, which equates to a lot of collecting area and a lot of observing time when you're talking about pushing out to redshifts of one or so. So in order to do all of this, here's what we need. And it is a bit of a daunting list. We need very high effective area to get the photons. We need the spectral resolution, which is an area in which we've, of course, made great strides with calorimeters, grading spectrometers that are going to be coming online soon. So it seems like we're doing the best right now in the spectral resolution category of things. We also need the wide band pass. New Star has shown us exactly how indispensable having the high energy information is to this science in terms of breaking the modeling degeneracies. Um, so that's certainly something to bear in mind as we talk about building future missions for this science to address it. And of course, high spatial resolution, especially as we want to push out to higher redshift source confusion is going to become an issue. So the spatial resolution is going to help us in that way, as well as in other ways, such as minimizing x-ray background, too. In terms of what's coming online, cross your fingers, knock on wood, Astro H is looking good for launch in just a few months, in 2016. So provided that all goes well there, we will have the very first x-ray calorimeter in space that will uh, give us a huge advantage in terms of our spectral resolution. Also, Astro H will have multiple detectors on board that will allow us to effectively do what New Star does and what the calorimeter does simultaneously without having to coordinate two different observatories to do the same thing. So Astro H is going to give us nice check marks in the spectral resolution box and in the bandpass box. Athena, which is coming up in 2028, is going to give us a further increase in effective area, but of course it has a few limitations. It's only right now going to go up to 12 keV. So, of course, if we're talking about needing the high energy data, we would need something like a successor to New Star in order to address that part of the spectrum and do these measurements that we're talking about. Also, of course, we're not talking about very high spatial resolution at this point, although it's an improvement over Suzaku's capabilities. Ideally, we would want something with loft type effective area, but unfortunately, loft did not make it through the M4 selection process in Europe. So, We'll see what the fate of something like this is, but I think this is a vastly under-addressed issue right now, um, how we increase our effective area and address these issues of pushing out to high redshift and getting the photons that we need. And then, of course, we have the X-ray surveyor concept, which could be a huge boon, especially to the spatial resolution part of the science in terms of getting us out to high effective area. One thing I would like to encourage in the community as we consider such a notional mission is that the effective area is important. The more we can have, the better we can do. We're doing very well right now in spectral resolution and with a concept like this in spatial resolution as well. But we need to have the effective area, and we probably will need to have another observatory to pair with it, such as a HEXP, a high-energy X-ray probe like a successor to New Star, in order to get those high energies, because, of course, cost caps are a realistic issue. 
So with that being said, um, I would like to leave you, I guess, with this final thought, since I know that the community here is very interested in the X-ray surveyor. Uh, this is certainly something that I'm looking forward to, and I know there's a meeting in, uh, in October, just next month, so I think this will be an interesting topic to pursue when we're talking about future missions such as this. Thank you very much. Yeah, has Newstar actually revealed any cases where it is indeed the uh, layered absorption that's mimicking reflection and, and, and reflection is not taking place? Not that I'm aware of, although I'm sure that that's been an offshoot of some of their investigations. That hasn't, nobody's done a specific investigation to sort of prove that point. But there are plenty of systems in which there seems to be an actively accreting black hole, and for whatever reason, we don't see broad iron line signatures. For example, NGC 5548 is one. Okay, I'm going to go on to suggest that if such systems didn't exist, then the bandpass requirement would be much less severe. True, but then again, you'd be limiting yourself in terms of which systems you would choose to study. <clears throat> study active galaxies, <laughs> and, and especially at larger redshifts. So, well, the bandpass requirement, of course, does lessen the further out you go in redshift. If you're going out to redshifts of one or two, you know, obviously you don't need to get out to 60 kV or something like that. And the coronal physics um, is one of the things that drives those high energy requirements as well, being able to separate out the curvature due to corona. <laughs> versus the curvature due to reflection, that's important. Mm -hmm. But of course, everything gets dragged down when you're talking about going out to higher redshift. So yes, if we're talking about looking at something of redshift two, then you don't need a hex B or something to pair with it. That is a very good point. I have questions. Yes, Jeff. I just wondered if you might comment on uh, whether or not Astro H is going to uh, help address, help create an unbiased sample, or else if there's any prospect for sort of uh, quantifying selection bias in some rigorous fashion. Astro-H I don't think is going to get us anywhere close to an unbiased sample unfortunately. What we're going to need in order to do that is is just a, a huge amount of collecting area to be able to probe out farther and get the dimmer objects. Mm -hmm. Right now like I said we are limited to the brightest ones and that's not going to change with Astro-H. So the unfortunate thing about our near-term prospects is that we're sort of limited to the same <clears throat> say 40 to 50 AGN out there that we know that we can do the science for. We can't, unfortunately, do some sort of flux-limited sample at this point. So is there any hope to do sort of Bayesian magic and, and quantify the, the bias involved in, in sort of how these sources appear compared to sort of a larger, uh, you know, AGN at large or something like this? I think that's definitely where they work. And I think that's work that, again, is kind of burgeoning up and coming, bringing Bayesian statistics to this type of science. because. Like I said, we're limited in other ways right now that we just can't control. So that's an approach that we have to take. Mark? Laura, we have this paper on Fisher Fund 48. You well remember the pain of it. Yes. Uh, where we <laughs> put a limit on any broad iron line. I haven't kept up with whether New Star has reobserved it and changed that conclusion or not. But if there are objects with no broad line, that could be zero spin or truncated disks or something. I wonder if anyone has gone any further with that. 5548, in particular, I believe, has been the subject of a multi-mission campaign recently that Yella Castra has led and been part of. And they caught the source in a very interesting deep minimum type of state where it was heavily absorbed. So it's a bit of a different beast than the state that we caught the source in. We caught it when it wasn't absorbed that thickly. But uh, their results also are consistent with no broad iron line in that case. What level of angular resolution better than <clears throat> Challenger would be beneficial? Order of magnitude better, two hours of magnitude. Would that enable you to observe something else? Something else. Well, I mean, the, the holy grail of being able to do this type of science is, you know, something that was bandied about several years ago, but I haven't heard much about it since. This Maxim concept of doing X-ray interferometry to actually image the event horizon. And we're talking about very different scales here, obviously. But, um, you know, that's something that is many, many decades off, I would think, at this point, considering not only our financial limitations, but our technological limitations right now. Well, short of maximum, is there a level of angular resolution that's interesting? 
Honestly, if we could get an x-ray surveyor concept with Chandra-like resolution, which is what's being talked about now, that would certainly be sufficient to get us out to redshift of two or so, which is what we need you know, to avoid the source confusion. But in terms of if you were to be able to do, say, an order of magnitude better in terms of your angular resolution, what would that give you? I'm not sure how much. Really, it's the effective area that's limiting us almost more than anything at this point in terms of radically expanding you know, by a factor of 10 or more our population of sources. ICSO, for example, and Gravitas, missions of that ilk, we're talking about being able to get spins for hundreds of AGN you know, with, a, with a modest increase in effective area. But if we'd like to get hundreds or thousands, uh, we really need to be able to kind of push out to higher redshift in order to do that and get this, the sources that we haven't seen yet. Okay, um, fortunately, we have to move on. Yeah, I'm happy to answer more questions later. Thank you. and thank you for being here today. And as Akash told, told you already, is this, is this too loud? Okay, because I speak loud already, so. <laughs> okay. So as Akash told you, I will, uh, will talk about two quite different topics. So I will, my talk will be divided in two, the first part of the second. And the first part is the one I, that I will describe what I've been working on before I joined CFA for my, for my PhD studies mainly. And so I've been, I've been studying black holes from the theoretical perspective. So let me first, and I apologize in advance if this is too basic, but let me go through a brief review of general relativity just to be on the same page of the things I will use today in my talk. And so general relativity tells us that mainly that phenomena arises from the curvature of the space-time itself rather than the fields and forces. And the theory of gravity is defined by a Lagrangian. So at that level is where we get the theory of gravity. And this Lagrangian in particular that has the scalar of uh, the curvature scalar called the Ricci scalar and the determinant of the metric is a very, a very important example because it defines general relativity itself. So it's the Einstein-Hilbert um, Lagrangian. And if, as you all know, if you integrate the, the Lagrangian, you get the action. And by minimizing the action, one gets the field equations from which the solutions are the metrics. And that's what I want to emphasize on, just in case, that the metric is just a particular solution for a theory of gravity. The theory of gravity has many solutions. And so different boundary conditions will provide you with different metrics, and that's what describes the space-time. And the space-time itself is not a theory of gravity. So the one, I, for example, general relativity has a lot of solutions that we know already about, and many that we don't know. And one is the flat space-time, Minkowski. And another one, the one I will focus on today, is the black hole solution. So this is the spherically symmetric solution, and is the unique spherically symmetric static solution of this theory. And it describes not only black holes, but the outside of any uh, spherically symmetric object, like a star. And so let me focus on these objects for a second. Um, so if one looks at black holes, one looks at the metric, at the first term, it's obvious that there's a singularity. So the metric diverges. The first term diverges at r equals 0. So this is a quite dramatic thing, because it doesn't mean that it's a very intense field. It means it makes no sense to talk about physics there, or at least we don't understand physics there. Fortunately, because of the cosmic censorship conjecture, so it's just a conjecture, but we believe that in general relativity, all the singularities are hidden behind a horizon, which is a much more friendly place that is still weird because time disappears there from the same first time. So it's still, it's still weird, but it's better than a singularity. 
So that's from the classical perspective. But if you think of them as quanti quantum objects, they get even more interesting. Bekenstein was the first to notice that these objects, these objects actually have an entropy. And not only they have an entropy, but the entropy is proportional to the area rather than the volume, as we're used to in physics, like an ideal gas. The entropy is usually related to the degrees of freedom of, of something. And this is proportional to the area. And then Hawking said, OK, if they have an entropy and an energy, and an energy, of course, comes from the famous equation, they must have a temperature. And I will go and calculate it. And he did. And he got the temperature, Hawking's temperature, that I'm sure everybody heard about the Hawking effect, the Hawking radiation, that it comes from the, the, the energy of the field itself, of the space-time itself, creates uh, pairs of particles, of particles and R-type particles. And in the case, remote possibility that one will fall in and one will come out, this happened enough times that you get a radiation, a thermic radiation from the black hole. And it's called Hawking radiation. This is problematic because the specific heat of these objects is negative. So as they radiate, they lose energy, so they lose mass, so they get hotter. They get smaller at the same time, and they get hotter. And eventually, very fast, very fast, I mean very long time scale, but at the end, it's very fast. They get hot, 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 disappear. And the main problem of this is a very hot topic right now that everybody's discussing, is the loss of information paradox. So what happens with the information that goes in a black hole and that we never hear about again? So a black hole hides everything in a way that doesn't tell you anything about what's inside. That's the no hair theorem. But, but if, if they didn't evaporate, OK, well, every, everything is in there. We cannot get it. But they, if they do evaporate, then we have a problem. Because we could use this that throw entropy into the black hole and then reduce the entropy of the universe. Obviously, this makes no sense. And it's not surprising to get such contradictions from an equation that it involves h bar and speed of light. What we really need, so this is just the realization of the fact that we do not have a theory for quantum gravity. So we just don't know physics in these regimes. We cannot talk about it. We don't understand it. So that's just a realization of a more fundamental problem, is that, we, that these two pillars of, of physics, quantum mechanics and, and general relativity are inconsistent, and we knew that. So we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, and I'm not going to give you one, unfortunately. But if we did, what are the predictions of a few good candidates? And I will mention string theory, and I don't mean to get in trouble for it. I'm just saying the predictions of the only consistent theories for quantum gravity are, among, among many others, corrections to gravity. And of course we need to correct gravity because we saw that it makes no sense like it is. So the corrections will appear only at short distances because that's where we cannot talk about the physics as we know it. And which corrections would make sense? Let me convince you that, that this term is the first correction to take into account. So this action is linear in the curvature. We, we should start by a, by a quadratic term in the curvature, just you know, to start building up. And also because it gives you short distance corrections that can be seen from the unities. Uh, you can ask me later if you'd like. And why this combination? This is the most general scalar that you can build of second order in the curvature. So the action has to be a scalar. It, can, it has to be invariant under Lorentz transformations. And this combination of 1, 1, and minus 4 is the most general one that will lead to second order field equations. So that won't get you into trouble when, when solving the equations to get the <laughs> solutions. So we, and also, independently, it comes from three different string theories. So this is super beautiful, if you ask me. So this is the gauss bonnet term. The gauss bonnet theorem is the one that tells you that this is the only combination. And from string theory, you find the same term. So I will couple it with a coupling constant. Alpha is just a coupling constant. And I will use what we had before. So Einstein-Hilbert action plus the gauss bonnet term. This is the einstein gauss bonnet theory of gravity. It's very close to general relativity, except for short distances. So it's not trivial to find a black hole solution or any kind of solution to a theory of gravity. But Bolwer and Desser, which 
Vesser is, it was at Brandeis, so it was very cool to meet him, um, came out with an equivalent solution to Schwarzschild of this theory. And it's pretty similar if you look at the metric at this level. This is the inverse of this, and it's quadratic, of course. It has two branches, and I don't mean to get into that because I don't have a lot of time, but one is unstable, and I studied both of them. So what I did in this, in this framework was I, I studied as an exercise. Let me emphasize, this is not a theory for quantum gravity. I'm not claiming this is the real theory of gravity of the universe by any means. I'm saying I'm going to do the exercise of seeing what the best motivated lead, next to leading order corrections that come from a, a theory of quantum gravity or a possible theory of quantum gravity Will ha what effects will this have in, in all the, the rest of, of the things I've been talking about, in the gravity itself, in the, in the paradoxes, in the consistency? So what I studied first was the thermodynamics of this theory. And as I told you before, if you take general relativity, the temperature diverges when, when the black hole is very small. So this is the temperature. This is the size of the, of the black hole in terms of the radius of the horizon. And the dotted line is general relativity. Einstein goes bonnet, something super beautiful happens thanks to the coupling constant of the corrections. At very short distances, the specific heat changes the sign. So they do not evaporate anymore. And if you calculate the time of evaporation, they turn out to be eternal. And again, let me make another warning because uh, Hawking just came out with a, with a solution to the theory for, for the paradox. I'm not saying this is the solution of the paradox, okay? By no means it's believable that in such a small remnant, all the information will be stored, and that's the nice, beautiful solution. No way. I'm just saying things can change dramatically just by adding short corrections, short-term corrections. I, I studied also the singularities because I forgot to mention in the black hole solution for this theory, the ball desser solution, it doesn't diverge anymore. Um, in R equals zero at the level of the metric. However, the richest scalar that tells you about the curvature still diverges at R equals zero. So we thought, is this important? Is this a less dramatic singularity or what happens? And actually, so from the classical point of view, a space is singular when you have singularity. So that means when you lose predictability for some, at least one trajectory of a particle at one point in space time, when you cannot say, what else will happen to this particle? This picture for the, from the quantum mechanical point of view is equivalent of saying we, what we want to have to have a regular space, so a non-singular space, is to be able to define at all times the trajectory or the evolution of all the wave functions instead of particles, right? That's the only difference. So for that, the, the, the sufficient condition is to have to be able to find a self-adjoint extension of the Hamiltonian, because that is what will give you the evolution of all the wave uh, functions. So this is the case in this theory. And then a wave function doesn't see the singularity. So it's super, super elaborated uh, animation, I know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but so what that means mainly is the singularity gets, you can think about it, it gets so narrow that only a particle will see it. But no wave function, no matter how energetic or high frequency it is, will fall into it. So that's why the metric diverges, but the metric not, doesn't diverge, but the rigid scholar does. Okay, so other thing I did during these studies was I was able to find a new way of constructing solutions that I don't have time to show you the way, but it's not difficult to understand and it's super nice. Uh, oh well, maybe I shouldn't say that. And one of the solutions, so we found a whole new family of solutions. And one of the solutions is particularly exciting because it's the first wormhole in vacuum. That's a forbidden, um, a forbidden geometry in general relativity. There was a lot of efforts to find wormholes of, in vacuum and they don't exist. And if you use the same procedure or something similar to, to this is space, right? Three-dimensional space. There's no time here. It's just the shape of the, of the space time. If you want to glue two Schwarzschild solutions instead of these two Bolward desert solutions, what you will get in the throat is exotic matter. So matter that doesn't fulfill the energy equations. That means some observers 
from some from, from some uh, for some observers the matter will be will have negative density so nobody wants that in in this theory for reasons that I can tell you about uh, later uh, you can have not only the the wormhole in vacuum that is an exciting perspective but a lot of different kind of beasts of this kind but instead of outside with outside outside with inside so this leads the theory already has some naked singularity, but this leads to more naked singularities and to a loss of the uniqueness of the spherically symmetric solution in the, in the sense of the Birkhoff theorems. So the Birkhoff theorem, theorems are the ones that are, is the one that warranties the threshold is the unique spherically symmetric solution. In this situation, you still have that bowler desert is the unique possible solution, but just locally. So each of these have to be bowler desert, but just locally. So that's weird enough because you could be standing out here and thinking there's a horizon and a very well-behaved black hole, but there isn't. So what we did next was to study the stability of these things and to study the space of parameters uh, in, in terms of what solutions are allowed and once, what solutions are stable, what are desirable, close. Some, some don't even have a general rel relativity asymptotic limit. So. That's what theorists do when they want to constrain their theories. But what I find super exciting is the perspectives of having a, an observation power for this to, to, stay, to say something about the theories of gravity. And fortunately, Laura already told us all about the, the iron line coming from the reflection of the, the reflected component of the, of the disk around a black hole. And so I will just tell you that it's a robust enough method to measure black hole spins right now. But it's a very exciting perspective for the future to measure more than that. So the iron line is built with, so what I show here is that different radii will have different contributions for the iron line. So purple is purple, as you can imagine. So this the, f the shape of each of these is telling us exactly about the, gra the, the gravitational redshift at that radii. So that's talking to us about exactly the geometry. So the black hole spins measurements, then you assume there's Kerr, that is the rotating version of Schwarzschild. However, if, there was, if it was not exactly Kerr, we could tell, possibly in the future, with much better data, uh, just looking at the iron line in this way. And there's been already there's work being done in this, in this direction um, with perturbations of the metric, just predicting what you would see. I want to just make clear that that's all very nice, but again, as I said at the beginning, a metric doesn't mean anything if it doesn't come from a theory of gravity, if it's not the solution of a theory of gravity. So what I think we should be ready for when we do have good data enough is to know what theories of gravity make sense, what theories of gravity we want to test, and what does that mean at the level of the metric. And that's a lot of work, but I think it's worth it because it will answer a very fundamental question. So the summary for this first part is that things change dramatically when just adding small corrections, small distance corrections to general relativity, and that it's super exciting that the iron line can tell us something about this in the future. Let me tell you about what I've been working on since I joined uh, CFA. <laughs> it's a bit different. I need to take a breath. So uh, I've been working on magnetohydrodynamic modeling of outer atmospheres. So um, we took a code called Batsaras that was originally developed to... <laughs> Sorry. It's funny enough. Okay. It was originally developed to, to model and describe and make predictions about space weather in the solar system. And we adapted it to be able to, to use it for astrophysical systems, so for stars. And so it's a magnetohydrodynamic model, so it solves the MHD equation, ideal equations. And the unique feature of this particular code is that it runs simulations from the chromosphere. So it includes the heating of the corona and the acceleration of the winds. It doesn't assume a hot corona to begin with. And that's a, that's a very important power of this code. And it does that uh, via alpha wave turbulence dissipation. And so the, 
the simulation, so the end result is a three-dimensional description of the plasma, of all the important uh, physical quantities in the plasma and the magnetic fields. This is an example of a fast rotating star. The, the colors on the stellar surface are the magnetic fields on the surface of the star, and that's what drives the simulation, so that's an input. And the output is the rest. The magnetic field lines are in white, and the colors you see on the equatorial plane are, is the density of the plasma, but one could <coughs> choose to plot the temperature, the velocity, or anything else. Okay, so we use that code to address different problems in astrophysics. So the, this kind of physics, the physics described by magnetohydrodynamics, is very important and relevant in many astrophysical problems. And the reason we haven't used them in the past is just because we didn't have the capabilities to do so. But that now that we do have the capabilities, we should approach these problems because it has a big impact in many problems in astrophysics. For example, we studied exoplanetary environments in this context. And what I'm showing here, so in M dwarfs in particular, why? Because um, habitability is usually defined just in terms of the distance of the planet to the whole star at which the, the planet can host liquid water on the surface. And for M dwarfs, that happens to be very close to the star. And M dwarfs are probably the most promising scenario to detect exoplanets because they're the most abundant star in the galaxy and because it's easier to detect them because they're close to the star. And so, however, the, the activity LX over L ball doesn't scale accordingly. These are very active for that distances. So it doesn't. It, the activity doesn't reduce enough to make this equivalent to being at the, at the Earth and looking at the, at the Sun, right? So we study this, we model this system, which is um, for a star, for an M dwarf that we had the magnetic field observation, so we model this star based on EV lag, and then three planets with parameters taken from uh, Kepler um, of planets in the habitable zone of other M dwarfs, and we studied the, the atmospheric conditions for these planets in this situation. And what I'm showing in color is the pressure of the stellar wind normalized to the pressure of the solar wind we experience in, in, experience in Earth. So you can see that it's pretty dramatic um, situation. And we studied this for planets with the, with the magnetic field like the one for the Earth, because we don't have information on the magnetic field of the planet, so we assume that they have the magnetic field of the Earth. And then we studied them without magnetic field and with an atmospheric model. And we find, as a conclusion, that, that these um, environments are quite hostile. And there, the possibilities of finding habitable zone in the more extended um, idea of habitability, that it's not so hostile, uh, might be more difficult than we thought it was. And that's why this got a lot of um, attention and it was released as a press release in WAS. Other system we tackled with these um, this simulations, they're relevant in the context of cataclysmic variables because the cataclysmic variable mass transfer and orbital evolution is mainly dominated for periods over three hours by the angular momentum loss of the system. And the angular momentum loss is always, is usually assumed to be coming from the secondary companion and modeled as a dipole. However, the, the compact companion, the white dwarfs, can have magnetic fields of up to 10 to the 8 Gauss. So this is really relevant in the system. And we studied this with, with simulations, and we find that the relative strength of the magnetic fields of the two stars, orbital separation and relative orientation, will make a change up to one order of magnitude in angular momentum loss from these systems. So, and we think, because of the, of the re relative orientation making such a big difference, we think that this system, QSVIR, that is a Y dwarf and an M dwarf, and this is X-ray flux, um, we see a, a big difference. So we, as, we, we see accretion, wind accretion on the Y dwarf from the M dwarf. 
And we see a big difference, like three orders of magnitude in these accretions over six, seven years uh, differences. And so we, f we think that that's what could be happening here, is that the M dwarf has a magnetic cycle, and when it's aligned, or, or the opposite alignment, it, it generates an accretion switch mechanism that sometimes it can accrete and sometimes it cannot. And so we're going to further monitor this system to see if this makes sense and it could be relevant for other systems. We also studied rotation evolution of sun-like stars. And so the rota what I'm showing here is angular velocity. These are all sun-like stars. These are open clusters observations. This is the age and this is the angular velocity. Open clusters observation is a, way, a good way to study rotation because it gives you a coeval group of stars. And so looking at this, we find that we don't know very well how to describe it. So stars are born with a distribution in angular momentum in, in rotation periods that we expect. Then they spin up until they reach the main sequence and they start their spin down process through magnetic winds. And this is magnetized winds are a very efficient way of losing angular momentum because they provide a lever arm that will make it efficient. However, after one billion years or so, they all converge for one particular spectral type I'm talking about. It's, it, it's true for all of them, but for each one, you'll get a very beautiful, um, unique function, function of H that will give you the rotation period. And that's what gyrochronology is based on, but I'm not going to talk about that. However, is quite the opposite situation for young and very active stars. We do not understand this is a huge dispersion, and if you're not convinced that we don't understand it, if you look in this parameter space to the observations of open clusters, you get that they, they show a bimodal distribution. And as you go to older clusters, I'm just showing two, but if you would go to older clusters, this branch, C and I are just historical names, gets less populated, and the I branch gets more populated until after one billion years, they're all in the I branch, and we can say, okay, gyrochronology is super nice. And this gap is, is, is always empty. So the picture is stars are born in C, in this branch C, or most of them, and then they transition very fast to the I branch. And there's been many attempts to explain this, but not very good ones. So what we notice with all our simulations is that the magnetic um, morphology that is driving the simulations, what what you put in, not only the field strength, the magnetic field strength, but the distribution makes a lot of difference. And this is not usually taken into account into the models to explain um, rotation evolution. So we ask three questions. First, is the resolution of the available observations good enough? This is a typical resolution of a magnetic map from a star. And this is reality, how we see the, the sun, so it's quite a difference in resolution. So is the resolution good enough or is it affects the results a lot? Are the active regions that we know are common in, in, in stars uh, affecting the results a lot? And what about the background, the large-scale magnetic field distribution? Because even though we do have these observations, they are not usually taken into account. Everything is modeled mainly more like a dipole. So for the first one, I have developed this method to make from low resolution, high resolution. Again, I'm not creating new information. It's just one of the possibilities. But it's good to keep all the other parameters constant and just analyze the effects of, re of resolution itself. So the flux is constant. Everything <coughs> else is constant. We run the simulations. And we find that the wind structure is not so affected by this. However, we have to be careful when we look at the X-ray morphology of stars because that gets dramatically affected. This is a real X-ray observation of the sun. This is the observation, this is the model run on the high resolution observation of the sun. And this is the low, the, the model run on the low resolution observation and the model run for the artificially increased. So these two are comparable because they have the same exact flux. So we just have to be careful. But in terms of the, of what I was talking about, the, the, the rotation evolution, it doesn't affect so much. What about the active regions question? So this is a plot of a typical wind structure for a dipole. It has open field lines and closed field lines areas that look like this. This, and of course the closed field areas, field line areas, do not contribute to the wind. The wind comes from the open line, line areas. So we find that we can um, 
uh, describe our results mainly by two regimes, when the spots are in the closed field areas or in the latitudes where there's otherwise open field areas. In the closed field areas, so low latitude spots, do not change things much for the wind. But when you put them in higher latitudes, this happens. They can close otherwise open magnetic field lines, and then you get the resulting reduction in mass and angular momentum loss coming from that. And the third question, and uh, the one I find the most interesting, because of the answer mainly, is in this context, in the context of this bimodal distribution, we studied what is the role of the, of the large-scale field, and we studied that by, so what I did was I did the multipolar expansion and run simulations for dipoles, quadrupoles, octopoles, and every term up to 10 in the multipolar expansion for different magnetic field strengths. So each spot here is a simulation. Magnetic complexity increased towards the positive x-axis. And this is angular momentum loss rates. And we see that amazingly it drops by three orders of magnitude just with the complexity of the large-scale magnetic field. And from this perspective, this shouldn't be a surprise anymore. Because also, let me tell you that observations say that younger stars are more complex in terms of magnetic morphology. So the picture here would be stars are born with high complexity and then they're not losing angular momentum at an efficient rate and they're stuck rotating fast without it being able to lose angular momentum loss fast enough or in an effective way at all until over time this gets eroded, the, 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 the complexity, and they go towards a di more a di dipolar kind of morphology, and this is the part we don't know why. We don't understand the dynamo. We don't know why, but that's what the observation tells us. And that because of this very steep curve here, this transition is very fast towards the branch where they're losing angular momentum in, an in a much more efficient way. So what I'm saying is we don't understand why the complexity changes, but if it does, this shouldn't be such a surprise. And maybe I, I have one minute, okay. And these are observations of Brian Wood that have been uh, getting a lot of attention because it's assumed, because of the issue of always thinking of a dipole, that mass loss rates go scale linearly like this, well, with, um, with X-ray activity, uh, with magnetic activity, because if you just boost the magnetic field strength, you'll get stronger fields, you'll lose more mass, right? That's the assumption. However, under our simulations, uh, however they find this, sorry, I didn't describe the pro problem properly, they find that for very active stars, there's a big drop in mass loss rates. And so, how can this be? This doesn't hold anymore. And so with our simulations, that's also explained because we find that just like angular momentum loss uh, goes down, mass loss rates drop by two orders of magnitude. So we're saying the more active stars will have much less efficient way of losing mass and angular momentum loss. So let me uh, finish by saying that these kind of modeling, this kind of physics that we cannot address in any other way than that, that modeling it, um, with massive parallel computing is, is um, relevant for many different um, astrophysical problems, as I explained, exoplanets, cataclysmic variables, stellar rotation, and many more. So all these I, that I show was steady state kind of solutions, and we're now trying to um, take into account what happens with coronal mass ejections, stellar flares, things that cannot be uh, described by a steady state situation but needs a time-dependent simulation. So that, that code can give us a time-dependent simulation, it's not a problem. And also I'm working on, I have developed a module to include in the code that describes a, a, a protoplanetary disk and we want to study with this how the wind from the disk and the wind from the star interact and how the energetic particles coming from flares that can ionize the disk, how their trajectories get uh, modified also by this interaction of the two winds. And I'll leave you with that and take any questions. Thank you, Cecilia. So with the questions, you may go a little over time. So if you have any urgent meetings, please feel free to leave now. <laughs> okay, questions? <laughs> so I have to admit, I'm a little bit out of my depth here, general relativity work. But um, you mentioned at some point that 
there is actually a method to to find solutions to, to the specific theories. I, I was quite impressed. How, how do you methodically find solutions to a theory of general relativity? I'm glad you asked. It's a super cool thing. Oh. <laughs> 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 Maybe I should be that. No, this is super, super not like that. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> oh, this is nice enough, isn't it? So yes, there's a good analogous problem that is, comes from uh, electromagnetism. So if you have an, a very simple, whatever, magnet, an, an electromagnetism a solution for, for the Maxwell equations, if you want to have two different solutions for the same theory, again, in different parts of the space, you can do that as long as you put a surface to separate them and you allow, from the boundary conditions of the theory, you allow some induced charge in between, right? And so you will get the same, but with, with induced matter, well, not matter, sorry, with induced charge in the, in, the, in the place where you expect a jump to happen. And that's what happens with gravity too. And that's why in general relativity, I said, these kind of solutions are never in vacuum. Because in general relativity, here I'm showing just the case of general relativity, these are Einstein's equations. You can have two different solutions, like, like I said, there's many. And the boundary conditions that are called the Israel conditions, it doesn't matter, but will ha we'll have the same effect. We'll induce some matter on the surface that separates them. And that matter happens to be exotic matter if you try to build a wall hole. But in the, I will show something with equations, but it's just one that I will point out. In the theory, in einstein gauss bonnet equations, the boundary conditions have this extra term. So if you want to do that in vacuum, that these are the ones of general relativity. This is the new term in the boundary conditions, and this is the induced matter. If you want the induced matter to be zero, in this theory of gravity, Einstein goes Bennett, this term is serving as a source. It's like having matter on the other side, if you just put it on the other side. And that's what allows us to have these things in vacuum in this new theory, this extra term that we get at the boundary conditions. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> well, that is an impressive method. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cecilia, do you have any idea of um, what, 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 what will be the, the impact of the corrections you're talking about on the care metric, specifically on the way we're modeling the, the iron line? Yeah, so, so would it be you know to the level of little ripples, or would it be? Mostly? It would affect the shape of it, as I showed at the beginning. Let me go back to that slide. Okay, <laughs> so the shape of the deformation of each one of these contributions coming from red, gravitational redshift might even be the same. But the difference between this one and the next one might be different. So the gradient might be different. In that, I don't have a prediction because I am not talking about one particular theory of gravity. What I did here was just an exercise of seeing how things get affected. Depending on the theory of gravity that you have, you will have differences in the metric that will vary. But, the, but definitely, I think the, the best answer to your question is the difference between different distances from the black hole will turn out to show a difference in the in the iron line shape mainly. Next question. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and following on from that, so from what I understand, your toy model there was for a non-rotating uh, black hole analog. No, it's a theory of gravity. So well, yes, I exactly. What I said. The, the metric you Yeah, the metric I used. Exactly. Was, was, exactly. Was, not, was the Schwarzschild analog. Yes. And did you investigate Kerr analogs, or do you have a sense, for example, is A over M equals one still a limit in it when you mess with things? So it's very, very challenging to find a rotating exact solution to a generic theory of gravity. We do not have for any, I think it's true if I say for any theories of gravity other than general relativity. It was hard enough there, right? It was hard <laughs> enough there. A rotating exact analytical solution. However, there's many attempts to do so, of course. And then you build this perturbed sleep. So it does make sense. It does have a good limit that is curved, actually. And 
the cost of it, so the bad side of having to do it perturbately, is that you can only see differences for very, so you have only a solution for very low rotation. Right. And so you want fast rotation for this. So we need to work on those right. theories. So you know, it's you it's need not it. easy to explore it's that high over, over mm -hmm. M case. Yeah. Right. So we need either very, very, very good data or very, very good people finding the analytical <laughs> solution <laughs> for that problem. More questions? I'm just wondering what you know about what kind of work people are doing to understand or model the decrease in complexity of the of the magnetic fields with, with age and, and the That's time scale as well. The time scale uh, in which. Yeah, like why does it decrease over, let's say, you know? I don't think we have enough data years. for that. We have enough data to be confident on that this is happening, mm -hmm. but not in constraining so well the models. However. Just knowing it happens gives you something to, to work on the dynamo that we do not understand the dynamo. So yeah, there's a lot of people working on dynamo theories. And if they are going to be able to explain why this happens over time or not, I hope they do, but I, am, I, I haven't seen anything in that direction yet. But these are not so all these observations, they're just now we're, we're saying this is the case over time. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if what you were saying about the magnetic complexity relating to uh, mass loss and, and sort of drag, if you think that would also be the case for uh, an accretion disk which had sort of different level, you know, an ordered uh, dipole field in a disk versus something that might be very patchy and chaotic, or is this sort of peculiar to spherical geometry? No, no, I think that's a general thing that happens when, so if you would need open field lines to lose matter in any way, in any way that you want to drive it, but through open field lines because it's, it's wind, basically, it's magnetic wind, then if you have different uh, polarities next to each other, what you will probably see is that this field, some of these field lines at least will close and will not allow the wind to escape. And so you will probably lose efficiency. I don't know the details for the different polarities in the disk, but I would say this is a general thing. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, spherical geometry, particularly, at least. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you're working on a 